The idea of an atom is that a given material can be divided down into smaller and smaller pieces until you get to a point where you have the very tiniest possible piece of that material. So for example, if you had some iron, you could divide iron down into tiny, tiny pieces until you get down to one single atom of iron. The idea that materials could be divided down and that there was some smallest piece of that material really goes back a long ways. In ancient India, they had the idea in the Jain religion back about the 6th century BC. And in around 450 BC, a Greek scholar named Democritus wrote about the idea and he called the idiom the atomos, which is where we get the word atom. And it meant that it was the uncuttable or the smallest indivisible particle of matter. And it turned out he was right, that the basic building blocks of matter are these little tiny particles called atoms. Although they can be, as we find out later, divided up even further. But once you do that, you destroy the property of that atom. So, for example, if this were this atom here in this picture it happens to be nitrogen, if you happen to break it apart then it, and, and, and knock out, say, an, a proton from the nucleus of it, the center of that atom, it would no longer any, be any further uh, nitrogen, but would then be something else. So uh, that it, Now, the interior of an atom c does contain a number of different particles with different properties, and I want to talk a little bit about those. Uh, you probably learned about that in grade school. There was the electron, the proton, and the neutron. Here we have a helium nucleus, and you see the exterior of it. You see the electrons on the outside, and interior, the protons and the neutron. They are electrical in nature. They have charges, and we say that the electron is negatively charged and the proton is positively charged. And uh, that electrical property is one of the things that holds the atom together. Protons are positively charged, and they're relatively massive, much more massive than neutron than uh, electrons are and the neutron is said to have no charge although it does have electrical and magnetic properties inside of it and uh, so these are the three basic building blocks of the atoms all atoms contain at least electrons and protons well uh, you could have atoms with no neutrons like for example hydrogen regular hydrogen doesn't have any neutrons it just has a proton and an electron you could even have an atom that only has a single proton, which would just be a proton, but it would also be a hydrogen atom without an electron, which would be called a positively charged hydrogen atom or a positive ion. Different numbers of protons and electrons mean that different types of atoms are of different size. Generally, the more protons and electrons they have, the larger they are. There is actually a lot of empty space inside of an atom. If you could blow an atom up to a mile across, then the nucleus, let's say this was an atom of hydrogen, and its nucleus would be a single proton, that nucleus would be about the size of a, uh, of a golf ball, maybe, or a, an orange at the largest. And the rest of it would be mostly empty space with, a, with electrons zipping around out there. So it's amazing to consider that a solid material, such as a piece of wood or a piece of copper or iron, is really mostly empty space. The atom itself is really uh, often portrayed as a cloud of electrons with a nucleus in the center. And if it were portrayed to, to scale, that nucleus would be very, very tiny. But you wouldn't even see it in this p picture here, for example. So uh, we really have this drawn out of scale. But the general idea is that there is a cloud of electrons around the nucleus. The nucleus wasn't discovered until relatively recently, less than 100 years ago, about 1911. It was discovered by shooting particles of charged particles known as helium nuclei. They're positively charged. And here we have a picture of a helium nuclei. They would shoot it at a thin foil of gold. What they'd notice is that sometimes the helium nuclei would bounce back as if they hit something very heavy, but most of the time they would fly right on through. And by uh, determining, measuring the number that went through versus the number that bounced back, they realized that whatever it was that in the nucleus, it was very, very tiny because most of the part, most of the helium nuclei would shoot right on through the thin gold and miss the nuclei of the gold.
the electrons exist in a cloud around the outside of the atom and they're, they're very light in weight and you can think of them as, as a cloud and they exist in, in shells. The electrons are extremely light and they are negatively charged. Uh, these are what we talk about when we talk about electricity generally. Electricity is the movement of electrons because they're able to move around, especially in metals and in a vacuum. And so like in a, in a CRT type television set, it uses a vacuum tube, the electrons are mo able to move through space and hit the screen and cause it to glow. Uh, the electrons are very, very tiny and they're hard to measure directly. You couldn't just weigh one or even, uh, but what you can do is charge up some little oil droplets and this is a famous experiment where little tiny oil droplets were charged up with electrons and you would notice that by putting a charge on the metal plates that some of the oil droplets would move, move up or down depending on how much charge was placed on the plates. And the some of the oil droplets would hover and then at the same time other ones would be rising and others would be falling. Well that would indicate that they had different numbers of electrons on them and uh, that would tell you that there was a certain amount of charge for the electron. There was a certain uh, distinct value of charge and you could step up by one or two or three charges at a t at, but you couldn't cut a charge in half and so the electron is said to have the fundamental smallest possible amount of charge known. The, this experiment is called the Millikan oil drop experiment and, and you, if you take a college physics or even high school physics class sometimes they do this experiment. There's another experiment you can do to, to learn about the electron's uh, weight or mass, and that's called the uh, e electron charge to mass ratio experiment. It uses electron beams, and you pass the electron beam through a magnetic or electric field, and it bends it, and you can learn about its charge to mass ratio. And if you do those two experiments together, you can actually calculate the mass of the electron. Now, the electron was first discovered as an accident. Thomas Edison is credited with this discovery as a side effect of his, as of his discover, invention of the light bulb. He noticed that sometimes light bulbs would get clouded on the glass surface, and he thought that perhaps a little bit of metal was evaporating from the filament and depositing itself on the glass. He wondered if he could stop that by using an electrically charged metal plate placed inside the light bulb. He discovered, though, that it that if he charged up the plate positively that sure enough something would come from the filament to the plate and he'd have a flow of electric current. If however he reversed that and made the plate negatively charged and the filament positively charged there would be no flow of electricity. This principle was put to work as a practical device called the valve or diode and invented by a gentleman named Fleming who further developed this idea. The diode basically lets electricity only flow in one direction from negative to positive. So it goes from the negatively charged filament to the positively charged plate. And the reason we have two batteries here in this diagram, these are, these are the symbols for batteries, is that one battery was responsible for charging for heating the filament. It had to be heated up to red hot. And then the other battery's purpose was to charge up the plate. And you see if we reverse the battery that's connected to the plate then and we made it the plate negative there would be no flow of charge, no, no electro, electric current would flow. That was then later made into a very practical device, the radio detector. Radio waves are alternating currents, electricity that moves back and forth. If we pass such a, a back and forth type of electricity through a diode like this, it will convert it into direct current that varies with the strength of the radio wave. And then that becomes audio or sound which can be used to drive a earphone or speaker. Then another invention that came from that as well called the triode. Triode has three parts, diode has two parts. The triode has the middle part called the screen or grid and the idea there is that by putting a voltage on the grid you can control the flow of current between the filament and the plate. And so this became then the basis of an amplifier. You could put a small signal in and control a large, a larger signal or you could, a weak signal could be amplified and made into a, a stronger signal.
as a result of the action. So this is another great invention because this was just at the time when radio technology was being, being invented and uh, this was a tremendous boost to the radio technology. As a, and another uh, thing you could do with that tube is you could take some of its output and feed it back on its input. Maybe you've heard sometimes a microphone in an auditorium where it feedbacks and squeals. Well, this basic idea is, was used then to make a radio transmitter because basically what a radio transmitter is is a device that puts out a high frequency alternating current, electricity that goes back and forth. And that was just exactly what they needed for a nice quality radio transmitters and so the triode also benefited the radio transmission as well as the radio reception.